Good morning. This is July 26th, 1999. This is here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. Would you tell us your name, please? Manny Abrams, or Emmanuel Abrams, if you want the long version. Manny Abrams was here in March, and he did a tape for us at that time. Uh, today he has additional material. He has things to show us that he didn't show us the first time. Um, Manny, why don't you go ahead? I see you have a list okay. there of topics that you'd like to cover. Right. I, I went over my first tape, of course, to make sure I wasn't doing any particular backtracking today on what I've already said. Uh, as a consequence, I have my little notepad here, note sheet, and I'll go from that. Uh, I flew my missions in the 8th Air Force between July 16th and December 28th, 1944. And I flew them all with the same crew except for two of my missions. I had some ear problem, I don't remember the nature of it, but uh, in November 44, I, or late October, I think I missed two missions and my crew had to have a, a fill-in navigator fly with them. Uh, I was in the infirmary for that period of time while they did that and after, uh, after I got out, uh, the squadron allowed me to make up the two missions so I could get back flying with my regular crew. So I flew two missions with another crew. I don't even remember who they were, but I was flying as a so-called pilotage navigator, which means I was sitting in the nose turret, the very front of the plane, uh, with two 50 caliber machine guns. It was a power turret that, that you could rotate um, by switches. Extremely tight uh, fit. I can't describe to you how tight it was to get in there with your electric suit on and all of that, even as a slim young man of, um, I think, 170 pounds or so at that time, with the electric suit and all the other material you have to have on you and your maps, getting into that turret was a two-man job and after you were in the turret and somebody closed the doors behind you, you knew you were in there, you weren't about to get out. <clears throat> and I had to think a few times, I'm sure, at that uh, when I flew those missions, that if there were any emergency and if I had to get out of that turret, I don't think I could have, not alone. Anyway, uh, the feeling was, uh, I was sitting out in the very front of this, of this plane. I could swivel my turret around under power and I could see the pilot and the co-pilot sitting up above me a little bit and behind me in their cockpit flying the plane. I could look out at the wings of the plane. I could see other planes in the formation and outside of that I just felt I was sitting up in the blue sky 20 odd thousand feet above the ground. Nothing, no visible means of support and it was really uh, an unusual feeling and to be doing pilotage uh, as, I was, as I was doing by having a map open, a small section of the map open of where we were headed, and when there were not clouds underneath us, I could uh, try to pick up where we were by, by visual method. Anyway, my concern also was, oh boy, I hope we don't have any enemy, uh, any f enemy fighters attacking, particularly from 12 o'clock position up in front, because they would be right at me. That would not be a happy note. It did not happen on those two missions. Uh, I'm sitting here, I'm happy to say that. Uh, I just thought I would mention those missions as uh, a little bit nerve-wracking. Uh, another thing that I thought I would mention, uh, I guess this is under the heading of one man's meat is another man's potatoes. There was a, a celebrated mission to Kassel, Germany, right in the middle of Germany, really, on September 27th, 1944. It was a very uh, uh, maximum effort type of a mission. I don't know what the target was in Castle, which uh, had many kinds of factories, airplane and tank and whatever. I don't know what we were attacking that day. But uh, I think all of our second air division, which would be 24s, and a lot of uh, perhaps B-17s were also involved on a subsequent stream of bombers going into that uh, location. And the German fighter uh, command rose up in force that day. I think there were something like five or 600 German fighters engaging the 8th Air Force stream of bombers going in and our fighter escort that we had. Uh, we didn't have anything like that quantity of fighters, I'm sure, with us at that time. But um, to this day, 
uh, there were some bomb groups in our stream that were heavily attacked and very badly decimated by the German fighters and by flak as well. Whereas our bomb group uh, had no major trouble that I can recall at all in it. We may have had, I'm sure we had some flak, but I don't think we lost any planes at all. Yet other bomb groups lost a great many planes and to this day uh, there, is a, a, there is a monument on the ground in Kassel, Germany celebrating or memorializing, I would say, that mission that day and the heavy casualties, mostly in the Luftwaffe side, but also on the 8th Air Force side, we lost many bombers. I don't remember the number. Uh, and I think uh, American airmen of that time and German airmen of that time get together once a year at that monument and do whatever they, say whatever they wish to say and hope that they will never have such an encounter again, or that there will never be a need for such. Manny, may I ask a question sure. about that? Um, was it common to mix and match planes? That is, did 17s no. fly with 24s? No, no. Can you tell me why or why not? The, speed, the cruising speeds were very different between the B-24s. B-24s were faster. I think our cruising, our indicated airspeed was 230 or 240, whereas I think the B-17 was 160 to 170. I may be wrong, but I don't think I am on those numbers. And um, it would have been either a, a terrible drag for the B-24s to stay down at the speed levels of B-17s or vice versa. Mm -hmm. B-17s couldn't fly at our speed without tremendous gasoline consumption. So no, we didn't fly the same missions. We flew separate streams. If, if we were going to the same mm -hmm. target, which may have happened, I don't know, uh, they would fly their bomb group, their missions, their, their bomb stream probably from a different uh, point of the compass as well going in and a different route as well. Uh, they also flew their missions at a higher altitude because, because they could. They could fly with a heavy load at a higher altitude than the B B-24s. So we would often see them and they would be up above us and not, not directly where we were. They might be 20 miles away or 10 miles away, something like that, but never right over us. That would be dangerous. <laughs> Anyway, another thing I thought I would mention is I don't know if I mentioned my very first mission on July 16th. Uh, the reason I remember it is this is my first mission and I don't know what to expect. And I was expecting something like uh, you cross the so-called enemy coastline, which would be any European coastline at that time, virtually. And uh, would there be flak immediately? And would there be enemy fighters? I just didn't have a good concept of what to expect. So I garnered unto myself as many flak suits, which were in short supply at that time, as I could. And I remember that on that mission, as soon as we got over the channel, I had one flak suit that I was standing on. That was to prevent flak from coming up, as I thought. And one that I hung up near me on some, some uh, hydraulic lines, I think. And, of course, I wore one. And there was nothing but flak, no fighters, and, you know, it was learning your way, I guess, the first mission. Uh, there isn't flak wall-to-wall -wall in Europe. Uh, it's sporadic, and it's at certain locations only. So anyway, that was my first mission. I got over that pretty easily. Uh, let's see. There's another significant thing about my first mission, which was on July 16th. My uh, my brother-in-law, Norman Robbins, he became my brother-in-law after the war, a few years after the war when he married my sister. He was a B-17 pilot, and he was flying his, I think his uh, 13th or 14th mission, I don't know which one it was, on the same day with B-17, with his bomb group, the 385th, going to a different target, and he uh, had some bad luck with flak, and, a, and he lost a couple of engines, and some other damage to his plane, and he had to abandon the mission. And so while I was flying my, this was my first, yes, it was my first mission, I'm sorry. While I was flying my first mission, my brother-in-law was flying into Switzerland. And he had a <clears throat> an interesting story which he has never written or told about how he uh, left Switzerland, how he escaped over the border and so forth. But that's his story. Uh, Would you tell Manny, I think, Weren't Americans interned in Switzerland? He was interned in, in the German part of Switzerland, which was not a good part, I think, to be in, on the northeastern part of Switzerland. And he ultimately just walked out a few weeks after he was there, I think. He uh, 
took a train. You could take a train. I mean, they let the, the internees uh, travel around in Switzerland. He took a train to the northwestern border, I think, or the, or the western border, and uh, had, had arrangements. With, uh, ultimately, was turned over to uh, the Marquis and, and, fr and uh, over the border. They managed to cross without any difficulty from the Swiss guards and uh, crossed through the Haystack region of France through, uh, through some occupied area, and he got to the American lines and ultimately got back to his bomb group. Mm -hmm. So he was very fortunate. Uh, let's see, what other thing? Next thing that I would mention here. Uh, I'm going to use this. Um, in September, on September, let me see, early, early September, uh, the Allied forces on the ground were well into into uh, France and into, uh, I think, some perhaps part of Belgium. And uh, they were seeking to penetrate, of course, to get to the Rhine River to establish a beachhead to get across into Germany. And uh, General Bernard Montgomery, the Monty, uh, the British uh, commanding general, uh, convinced Eisenhower that he should be allowed to set some British paratroops, drop some paratroopers in uh, so-called uh, market basket operation, I don't know why it was called Operation Market Basket, uh, to drop them into Holland around Nijmegen, Eindhoven, uh, in the central part of Holland near the Rhine, and they would establish a beachhead, uh, they would capture a bridge and uh, open up uh, Germany to the Allies. And Eisenhower and the Supreme Commander said, okay, go do it. He dropped his paratroopers in, uh, as I heard later, uh, subsequent to the war, uh, they had a lot of trouble with supplies and with their communications. Anyway, uh, the Eighth Air Force, part of the Eighth Air Force, was scheduled on a low-level mission, and I mean 50 feet, which we never did before, and we never did it since then, to fly at uh, virtually a treetop level or, uh, all the way from England, but tried to be below the uh, radar screen, uh, which we were fly across just above the waves in formation and uh, fly in and drop supplies, uh, gain a little altitude when we got into the drop site in near Nijmegen and Eindhoven and uh, Arnhem in, the, in that sector. Okay, let's see where I'm talking about here. Uh, this is a map of Holland. The site is up here. Here's Nijmegen. Is Eindhoven, uh, Arnhem, right here. So the paratroopers were, the British paratroopers were dropped in here and were totally pinned down by the Germans, I will say that to begin with. And we were to fly in at low level mission, uh, low level, right across the dikes and the outs outside of Holland here and fly in to drop supplies. Well, we had the supplies all right. Uh, couldn't use any true navigational maps because we weren't high enough up. We had to use virtually a road map of Holland and we were flying uh, the, the uh, bomb group that was leading the mission really had to use road maps because there was no other way to navigate. You weren't high enough up to, to pick out sites. <clears throat> and uh, I remember coming across the, the English Channel, in the North Sea at this point, the North Sea, as we approached Holland, which was very quickly done, we saw, I saw little uh, uh, Dutch uh, fishing boats out, just the way you'd picture them to be with rounded ends on them, I remember. And I remember seeing uh, Dutch fishermen standing in the boats with sort of a concob looking pipe and with caps on and looking at us. And they were wa some of them waved to us. Some of them had the courage to do that because they were still German occupied, but there were no Germans with them. And uh, we got, we, as we approached Holland, approached the dikes, we actually had to pull up to get up over the dikes. We were that low. And I remember the comparison that I've made between uh, Dutch cattle that were on the other side. They were just absolutely in, in frantic behavior pattern. They were running all over the pastures, uh, seeking to get away from this thundering noise that was suddenly on top of them. Uh, they didn't, uh, they of course wouldn't know what it was. Um, I was comparing them in my mind. I remember to back in England, we flew all over East Anglia. There'd be lots of cattle. They couldn't care less about airplanes. You could practically land on top of a cow in, in uh, East Anglia, and they wouldn't pay any attention to, to what was going on. 
but Holland was not used to that, the, the, uh, the cattle. And uh, we would fly right by along the road, practically following a roadway, and we'd come to a little village. There would be the usual uh, church in the middle of the, of the town square, and there would be a German soldier, more, more times than not as we passed these little towns, with a submachine gun firing at us. I mean, we were practically on a level with uh, the, the tops of the steeples. And uh, we heard patters upon the plane. Nobody uh, in this mission on our plane was hurt at all, or hit. Uh, and occasionally, our, our machine guns would answer their fire, but not too often. We were going by very fast, and uh, there wasn't really time to do any serious firing. And we got to the drop area. We'd pull up a bit. We dropped our supplies, which I understand later the Germans could well use, because the Germans got most of the supplies, if not all of them. I don't know how much really did any good. Ultimately, the mission, not our mission, but uh, the mission of the paratroopers was a failure. They were captured ultimately by the Germans. Uh, they did not capture any bridge. Uh, Is this the incident that, would, that was celebrated in the bridge too far? I don't know. Um, I, I really don't know. I, that keeps coming to my mind, a bridge too far, but I don't know. But that was the point of the bridge too far. But this was certainly a bridge too far for the British paratroopers. They never reached it. Anyway, then we pulled up and we, we came back at a more normal several thousand foot altitude, I'm sure, just leaving Holland. And, uh, but the memory of that mission has always been with me, uh, seeing, uh, seeing enemies on the ground, the, uh, people on the ground shooting at us and our shooting back, and the entire meaning, uh, the entire action of a war was very much present in that mission, whereas most of all of our missions were at high altitude. We didn't see what happened when our bombs dropped. We were totally out of touch with whatever damage we were doing, except for later pictures taken, uh, reconnaissance. Uh, let's see. Ah, another, another keen memory I have of uh, my, my time in the 8th Air Force was at Christmas 1944. That was uh, just after the Battle of the Bulge had started. The Germans had broken through and were fighting their way west across, uh, across Belgium, uh, trying to cut off the uh, Allied troops. They were, it was a pretty scary time. The weather was totally cooperative with them. Uh, we had, I've never seen weather like that before. It was just, you could see ice formed in the, in the blue atmosphere. I mean, on the ground, you would look around, and you could see little shiny points of, uh, of, of ice in the air. That was several of those days during the Battle of the Bulge period, which was from about the 10th of December, I think, till, uh, till about Christmas 25th, about two weeks of that. And we could not fly any missions at all to support the Allied troops that were under severe attack then. We were all stuck on the ground. And um, several RAF bombers had put in to our base also uh, because they couldn't get back to their base. The weather was so bad. And I remember we were interested to talk with the RAF uh, uh, flight crews to see. They, they flew at night only. We flew at day only. And our view in the 8th Air Force was, you, you know, you have to be a little bit crazy to fly at night and to fly alone because they could not fly in formations for, for uh, mutual support, uh, combat support. They flew one plane at a time at night. And the Germans had uh, night fighters that they put up against them. And it sounded to us like it was very dangerous. And they looked at us and thought, you crazy Yanks. I mean, you know, flying in the daytime, they can see you, you're absolute targets. So it was th that kind of... Uh, admiration and uh, discussion between the two sides, the RAF thinking we were crazy, and we weren't saying crazy, just saying how dangerous it was what you Yanks are doing and how dangerous it was what you RAF flyers are doing, the way uh, flying at night or flying at day, in the day. Now that was, that was an interesting period also. We were very happy when, uh, when the weather cleared and we could finally get back <coughs> to flying some missions and supporting the Allies. Let's see, another thing, we used, to, uh, we used to fly what we call slow timing an engine. Uh, when a new engine was put on a plane, it had to be broken in for a certain number of hours, and we would, uh, for some uh, 
some flying practice. Uh, crews would be assigned to just take up a certain plane and fly it around in a specified area of England just to get hours, on a certain number of hours, on that engine. And we did that several times, flying around parts of England. And on one of the times we were slow timing uh, an engine, uh, fog crept in totally. I mean, I never saw such fog. We were not at very high altitude, a few thousand feet, and it was just a total carpet of clouds below us. Uh, the, the difference in the cloud formation and the fog formation, really, was that the tops of the fog was very level, whereas when you see the tops of clouds at high altitude, they were a very bumpy surface to the tops. Uh, we were stuck above the clouds. We had no way, there was no way to get down to land again. And you had to go somewhere either where there wasn't fog and where you could see a runway or what. Or the, the or what answer is uh, the British had a system called FIDO, which oddly enough stood for FOG, Intensive Disposal of, F-I-D-O, OK. And uh, what they, uh, they rigged up 14 of their RAF fields uh, with troughs running down the side of, uh, of, of a couple of runways, I guess, on the field. And somehow they would run fuel, gasoline, down through the line, right down the, through these troughs, and set them on fire. And uh, what would happen as a consequence was a perfect runway was cut out right through the fog. I mean, it was just amazing. You'd see nothing but fog everywhere below you except, oh, there's a runway. And uh, that's how we got down from that. And that, that was an amazing, an amazing feature. I don't know whatever happened, uh, whether it's the expense or what, that, that would have stopped the use of that in peacetime. But Manny, it was very in, effective. In one of these uh, slow engine flights, did you get credit for a mission for those flights? No, no. I've forgotten, what, I don't know what the exact rules were, but to get credit for a mission, you had to cross the, the uh, enemy coastline. Mm -hmm. I think you had to penetrate that. And I think it was automatic if you did that, that you would get credit. I'm not sure, but I think that was it. Mm -hmm. because, because there was one mission that we had to abort. Uh, we could not go along with it. I've forgotten what the cause was. We had some difficulty and we had to leave. We, we did not get credit for that mission. Uh, August 12th, that's another memory I have, near the town of Rams, R-E-I-M-S in France, it was a beautiful, clear summer day, and uh, we were going on a fairly routine kind of a mission, I think, to, to uh, bomb a, uh, a bridge somewhere in that sector, and, and, and the, the group was. And for some reason, uh, they said we, had to, uh, we couldn't do that. We had to choose another target. They already had laid out for you your primary target, your secondary target, and, uh, and other possible targets if you couldn't do those. So we were waiting for the decision from the group leader as to what target we're going to, where we're going. And we were circling over, over this part of France, beautiful clear day as stated. And there was just about one flak battery down on the ground somewhere. And the flak was way off, I remember, way off in the distance. And we, kept, we would circle around, and the whole group would circle around, and we would pass right through the range of that flak battery. And the flak kept getting more and more accurate. I, s I asked the pilot, do we have to do this? I mean, <laughs> it was a terribly, mm, terribly uh, dangerous kind of maneuver. We would just be coming right back into where the shells were really exploding. But anyway, we survived that. We didn't get hit. Uh, that's just a memory I have of, of the, how beautiful that uh, sunny day was over France with that one flak battery that was threatening to us. Uh, Another thing I remember very clearly was the first time I saw a German jet fighter in the air, an, an uh, ME-163 jet. Uh, you see, that was on a mission towards Aachen and Eschweiler in November, I think it was. And uh, we had never seen one before. And I saw this cigar-shaped kind of a, of a plane off on the horizon. Uh, the Germans had two different kinds of jets. One was a twin-engine jet, the ME-262, I think, which I never saw. I just saw this ME-163, which was their very first jet. And uh, suddenly I saw this thing just come zooming right in uh, through our group, just passed through our group faster than any fighter plane I had ever seen. We were all startled, of course, to have this happen. Uh, it was just 
it was just the sight of that and the knowledge, uh, the feeling that if, if the Germans really had a lot of these planes, I don't know what would have happened in the war. The war certainly would have been prolonged in the air terribly because uh, there was no fighter. We, uh, P-51s, P-47s were probably 75 to 100 miles an hour slower. I don't know if it was even more the differential than this little jet would be. Anyway, nothing happened. Hitler made the right decision and decided that he shouldn't build them, that he would put his, uh, his uh, energies in another direction, the military build up, and so they didn't have more of these jets. That was a nice thing. Uh, time for a map again. When, when I would fly a mission, coming back from a mission, I, I sort of had a marker in my mind for where the mission really ended. Safety seemed to be uh, uh, a condition that I could count on, and that was when we got over Holland, a little, uh, seeing a little town named Zwolle, Z-W-O-L-L-E. And that was, when I saw Zwolle down on the ground, I felt, okay, we're all right now. Uh, we're gonna get through this one all right. Now here's, here's a courtesy of KLM who sent me this in the mail to have me travel to Holland, I think. Anyway, this is a, a map just of the Netherlands, of Holland, the whole map. Uh, this is the present Zyde Z here, the, uh, an ocean coming in. And when we were flying our missions, here is Zwolle, right in here, Zwolle. The Zyde Z was a totally open area uh, and encompassed everything because Zwolle was right on the edge of the Zyde Z. That's how I could always recognize it. I saw this little town. And this just shows you <laughs> what has happened since, since the war ended. The Dutch have filled in all of this land here, the Polta lands. And Zwolle is an inland town. It's not on the sea anymore. Amazing. Did you ever go back there on the ground? No, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to visit Zwolle. <laughs> I never tell did. Tell the people about uh, your uh, flights what, over. What, what you meant to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never did. I'd like to. We've been over. I haven't been to Holland since the war either. Uh, show a few things here. First of all, I just brought along for no good reason. This is the actual piece of paper that was in my, uh, my combat kit or whatever. This is a record of, of the missions I flew, typed as it was by some, some sergeant or other in, at uh, company headquarters at the 392nd Bomb Group. A few misspellings, but not too bad. I've made copies of that since. How many missions total? 30. 30 missions. Uh, a few other things that I thought could be interesting. This is, this is just uh, a map of the whole 8th Air Force here, of where bomb groups, fighter groups, supply groups, whatever, all just 8th Air Force. This is East Anglia, the hump of England sticking out. This is the wash up here, so-called. and. Uh, you could see how packed it was and how many, I mean, I think there were at least 3,000 mostly bombers, but some fighter planes that were based at these various dots on this map. And that's a lot for that area, a lot of airplanes. This is a listing down the side. That's one exhibit. How did we... I was extremely impressed with, with, uh, with our war effort, the way uh, this country could organize itself and, uh, and accomplish something when it really sets out to accomplish it. Uh, the complexities of just the 8th Air Force alone are really staggering when you consider all of those planes in a small area, just the simple issue of how are you going to get those planes on a mission to take off, not conflict with other bomb groups that are not very far away from yeah, I mean, there was no bomb group that was remote from another bomb group. They were all close. So it was all very carefully mapped out by uh, the, the Air Force. Uh, each of these designs on here, these little rectangular boxes, are the way a particular bomb group was to, uh, to form up for a mission, where they were to go. For example, this, this mark up here with the coloration that I put in, that's my bomb group, the 392nd. And we were, we were based, where am I here? We were based right here, and we were all to go on this kind of a heading and form in that rectangular box over the wash. The wash is a body of water that comes into 
the corner of East Anglia there. And each bomb group had to follow. Th there was a, a bunch of a, a, a radio beacon that would be in this box that our plane, every plane in, in the 392nd bomb group would home in on after they took off from the field and uh, form up in that rectangle by homing in on that little beacon. And all of these, all of these bomb groups here had their own beacon their, or their own flasher. There are different names for, for the device, but it was a radio beacon that you would home in on and get to your formation area. And you would stay in that area until the, the line of, uh, uh, of combat was formed up. I mean, which bomb group was going to be the leading bomb group of, uh, of a wing of a division, all of that. That's got to be very, that gets to be very complicated, and I, I'm not even qualified to talk about that, how it all worked out. But uh, our bomb group would fall into its position in the, in the bombing stream, and I think it was very, very intelligently done. And what have I got here? This, this is just a, a little map of just the B-24s alone of their bomb, of where their bomb groups were in East Anglia. There I am over here. Nothing significant. Hmm. This is fairly useless, but at the time, located on this map that we had. I don't know why we would have this map then, but I would locate where the target was, different cities that we went to, or airports or whatever, and excuse me, I drew a straight line uh, from our base to the target area, which is never the way we flew. Uh, all of our missions were, were flown in uh, varying patterns, carefully laid out before the mission. Uh, of headings, uh, how long you would stay on it, at what time you would turn from that heading to another compass heading. Um, the concept being, first of all, you had to do that to some degree in order to avoid known German flak emplacements where they were. You don't want to fly over flak. And the other thing was, of course, it would keep the Germans, we hoped, guessing as to where are we going ultimately. If we keep turning and changing our headings, uh, they don't know where to put up the heavy defenses. I think they got to be pretty good at, at out guessing or guessing where we were going later in the war. Uh, actually, there's a whole fan of where where my missions were there. What was your furthest, man? Munich, uh, down out to all here. the way down to Bavaria. Yeah, yeah. Oberfaffenhofen. I always liked that name. <laughs> I didn't like the target, but I liked the name. This was the mission that I talked about. I think on on our first hour. Uh, first tape uh, where I hung up my wristwatch to uh, mm -hmm. be able to Anyway, that's that. Was the fleck essentially very heavy down in that area. We had a gentleman in this room just a week ago who was shot, shot at by uh, ME 262s. Yeah. Right, specifically where you're talking about. Was that a hot corner for you, fellas? Anywhere was. Uh, my my yeah. hot corner was uh, Hanover, Brunswick. I always mm -hmm. did not. I I never wanted to go there after with two times going there. Um, but I felt that the flak was worse in, in Brunswick and in Hanover than in the other place I had been. But it varied for every crew, it just, uh, every bomb group the experience. Mm -hmm. The Germans also started putting their flak guns, instead of having them in rigid emplacements around cities, they put them on flat railroad cars. And they started uh, for a while successfully moving around uh, by railroad. And you never could be certain just what you might run into because they could have moved in uh, heavy guns again. And that was probably stopped by our bombing of the marshalling yards and the railroad lines. I mean, uh, all of transportation was ultimately stopped in the latter part of the war, I'm sure. I took along some other things that were in a so-called escape kit that we carried. These are, these are maps that were issued to each of us. We had little plastic box, little plastic box of maps, and a morphine syringe, and a little K ration, I think. And I don't know. I never opened my box to see. There was no call to do that. But here's uh, 
This is made out of silk. It's beautiful. It's a very nice material. Uh, if you were shot down and were escaping across Germany and it was winter, you could use this for warmth. You could use it as a blanket. It would, it would, be, uh, it would hold in body heat. You could wrap it around your head. Now I've got it all unraveled. Did you get a map for each area you were going to go into? Actually, I'm, I don't think so. I mean, I have here, I think, maps of Spain, Portugal, and some other things that were in my escape kit, and we would never, we never went down anywhere in that area. This is Holland, the one I'm folding up. Holland and, some, and northern Germany, I think. So this could have been useful. Holland, Belgium, France, Germany, all on this map, on this one. These are extracurricular, not, not useful at the time. But it's beautiful material. Never saw maps made like that since. And here I have money. This is phony money. This is escape kit money. Uh, it's sort of falling apart. I have to be a little careful with it now. But this is a hundred, uh, hundred French francs, 100 francs, uh, which has no value anymore, I understand. I once went into a bank several years ago and said, is this, is this real money and is it worth anything? And it was not real money, but it would have, it, it would have uh, been useful then if you were on the ground. This money was, was money in, in 1943 for 1944 in France. Um, let me see whether I have rounded out everything here. Well, I, I really have talked about as much as I thought I would on the balance of my experiences. Don't forget uh, these. Oh, wow. Please. That's true. Air metal. Okay, I brought along my show and tell part here as my air metal. Let's see what I can show you here. It's already mounted. I never have had it out of the box. It's just a metal. <laughs> no names are on it. Don't you have uh, four of these? Yeah, well, I have. Whoops. Good. Excuse we'll me a minute, it. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, ooh. The four of them I have is, this is, this is an air metal also, the backing, and these are three oak leaf clusters. So that's 6, 12, 18, 24, 30 missions. Each, each cluster is six missions. The metal itself is six missions. And then this metal at the conclusion is another six missions. So it's 30 missions that represents. Air metal. I got a citation with it too, I think, uh, some kind of a citation. Here is the Distinguished Flying Cross that I got. Let's see if I can show this. That's the Distinguished Flying Cross. That looks impressive. Uh, I think these are some of, some of the ribbons that I wore on my uniform. I'm sure they are. which I can't even interpret anymore. But OK, the thing that surprises me about the, the Distinguished Flying Cross is that this is the citation that came with it, which is on tissue paper, like it's a carbon copy or something. And it's just, you know, words stated. It's, it's a boilerplate kind of uh, words for extraordinary achievement and so forth while serving as lead navigator of B-24. Anyway, I was just surprised that this is the formality of it all, that. And but the, don't drop that there. Uh, what did you have to do to get a medal like this, an, an award and a It was citation? Never, never spelled out, certainly. Um, I, I feel it was mostly existing through, uh, through your tour of duty, 30 missions in our, at our time. They, kept, they did change the number of missions one, uh, that you had to fly in order to finish, uh, finish a combat uh, tour of duty. When we first got there, I think it was 35, and then it was lower to 30. Uh, if you were a lead crew, and we were a lead crew, um, and you had to fly a certain number of missions as a lead crew, which we did, we qualified for that. Um, I think it was automatic. We got distinguished flying. Everybody on my crew got a distinguished flying cross. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure that they did. And I think any, any, certainly any lead crew that finished their tour of duty would have. Uh, it was an automatic issue. Mm -hmm. I don't. Would think you tell us the difference between a uh, a lead crew and any other crew? Well, uh, any other crew would not be assigned 
for example, to lead a squadron, which would be a, up to a dozen planes as part of a group, or a group, or a bomb wing, or a division, or the Air Force, that really would be. And I don't know wh what the selection process was, but uh, uh, the officers in charge of every bomb group, one of their duties would be to find out which, uh, which crews were the best crews in each of the squadrons. There were four squadrons in every group. They had to determine that, and they did a lot of that by flying with them sometimes as a, a so-called command pilot. We would have, I think on, a, on one or two missions, we had a command pilot with us, somebody that would be flying uh, along with the cockpit crew and just observing, really. Uh, a dangerous way to evaluate, but that's mm -hmm. what they did. And I guess we got selected after a thorough evaluation. I mean, uh, they decided we were just a good crew and uh, would be good for leadership. So we were. <laughs> Did that mean you literally led the spearhead going into combat? I could, we could have. We could have been selected on one mission. There was a mission that was scrubbed, that was canceled because of the weather ultimately, but where it all boiled down to our bomb group was going to lead the bomber stream going into Germany, and we were going to be the lead of the bomb group that, uh, for that mission, which caused me some panic. I wondered, you know, am, am I going to be given some assistance here? That was a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of responsibility. It was scrubbed, finally. But usually, I think, a, a lead crew leading a whole, a whole, uh, a whole bomber stream would have uh, so-called PFF equipment, which was uh, uh, some form of radar that, w oh, it was radar in those days, Pathfinder radar. They would have a, a special operator for that, uh, and they would have some other assistance as well to make sure that mm -hmm. they were on track perfectly, which didn't always happen even then. Uh, we had one mission, I remember. Oh, this was not a uh, lead crew problem, but this is meteorological, where we got to our initial point, the IP, and from there on it would be about an eight-minute run, presumably, to the, to the target. And we started off on the, to, on, the, uh, on the target run, and we had a headwind, which is the way they do not wish you to fly. They want you to fly with a tailwind so that you have the least exposure uh, during the bomb run. And we had, I think we had a 100-mile-an-hour headwind, which uh, was a serious slowing factor for, uh, for the bomb group. I mean, we were about 15 minutes flying, exposed to heavy flak all the route. Uh, I'd, I'd forgotten where it was. But that is not the way things are supposed to be. But that was not a navigational problem. That was a meteorological problem, which you can't change. You just can't change headings and mm -hmm. have so many planes dependent on that. So Before I we uh, started this tape today, you mentioned that there is a, uh, a book in this library yeah. uh, which has you in it. Would you tell us about that? Well, that's a book called The Mighty Eighth by uh, Gerald Astor. That was the, the latest publication I know of. That was a 1997 book. Uh, it's really a lot of interviews with a lot of uh, Eighth Air Force flyers, and I became one. Couldn't tell you how, but uh, I was one that I uh, had. Well, I could tell you how because I had done some writing. Uh, I wrote some of my stories, and some of them were published, and somehow. Gerald Astor got in touch with me, and uh, he used a lot of my stories, I edited and so forth, changed a little bit, I mean, as far as the wording, but uh, they're in the book. Uh, I'm in a f some other books as well, as long as we're being modest here. <laughs> um, but okay, I mean, uh, one, we have a book on just the 392nd bomb group, my bomb group, and um, there is a, a, a publishing company down south, Turner Publishing, who, whose specialty is putting together these uh, combat group books and so forth. And I thought it was pretty crummy myself. I mean, I have it at home. I'm not very proud of it. I'm, I'm quoted uh, to some extent in there as well, and there are lots of pictures and so forth. But I think a commercial job is not a good job, on, mm. from my point of view anyway. But that's... I think I've covered about all the things that would be of interest to a later civilization, perhaps, to hear about. 
Manny, we thank you very much for coming back. Okay. I appreciate your being thank here, you. and you've added a great deal. Um, I wondered today what we would talk about that we didn't the last time, and I feel last time we just began to scratch the surface. Oh. And I'm pleased yeah. that you thank came you. back again. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay.